Continuing to work on advanced integration techniques, we're going to answer the question, how do we integrate a fraction? Probably more appropriate to say, how do we integrate a rational function, which is basically just a fraction. And the idea behind what we're going to do is this. If you had to choose to integrate 3x over x squared minus x minus 2 dx, or to integrate 1 over x plus 1 plus 2 over x minus 2 dx, which one seems the easiest to do? Well, the first one, we don't really have a way to integrate. We could try to use u substitution with x, u equals x squared minus x minus 2, but then du would be 2x minus 1 dx. The numerator is 3x. There's no minus 1. That's not going to work. Versus the second integral here, we know the integral of 1 over anything is the natural log of that stuff, as long as the derivative is 1. We have to divide by the derivative of the inside if there was something in there. Plus 2 times the natural log of the x minus 2 plus a constant. And that quickly we're done, because the natural log is just 1 over the stuff. That integral is much easier to take. And that's the idea behind what's called partial fractions. The idea of partial fractions says I can take a fraction like 3x over x squared minus x minus 2. And that's going to be equal to some other sum of fractions. If we factor that denominator, we'll end up with x plus 1 times x minus 2. The numerator is still 3x. And the idea behind partial fractions is this fraction is the sum of some numerator we'll call it a, over the first factor, x plus 1, plus another mysterious numerator, we'll call it b, over the second factor, x minus 2. So if we can solve this for a and b, we'll find out what values break this fraction down from one complex fraction to two simpler fractions. Well, we can solve rational equations by multiplying by the common denominator of x plus 1 times x minus 2 on each factor, x plus 1 times x minus 2 and x plus 1 times x minus 2. When we do that, the denominators divide out with several of the numerators. And we're just left with 3x equals a times x minus 2 plus b times x plus 1. And what's important about this equation is this equation has to hold true regardless of what value x is equal to. That means I can just pick any value for x I want and solve what we end up with. So let's pick something convenient. Let's pick something that will make either a or b go to 0. Notice if we let x equal 2, that first factor on a will go to 0. So we have 3 times x, or 3 times 2 is 6, equals the a part goes to 0. b is times x plus 1. 2 plus 1 is 3. Divide both sides by 3. And now we see b is equal to 2. We can do the same thing on the other factor. Let's let x equal negative 1, because that makes the last factor equal to 0. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3 equals a times x minus 2. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. And if we divide both sides by negative 3, we find out a is equal to a positive 1. So back on our original fractions, we have a over the x plus 1, or 1 over the x plus 1 plus b, which we found out was 2, is over the x minus 2. And this fraction is what we said was easy to integrate, much easier to integrate than the original fraction. 
So that's what we're going to do today is we're going to break up the hard fraction to integrate into smaller pieces that are easy to integrate into its parts, into the partial fractions. There's really three cases under partial fractions that we want to look at. Partial fractions. The first case is the case we've already seen when we have what we'll call non-repeated linear factors. For example, if we have the integral of x plus 1 over x plus 3 times x minus 2 dx. We're going to split this up so that we have some mysterious numerator over the first factor, x plus 3, plus the other mysterious numerator over the second factor, x minus 2. Now, we know when we multiply both sides by the least common denominator, we'll end up with the first one already has both factors, so they'll divide out x plus 1 equals. The a fraction is missing the x minus 2 factor, plus the b fraction is missing the x plus 3 factor. Now we can pick convenient values for x to make each of those values go to 0. So we'll start with letting x equal 2. Plugging 2 in, 2 plus 1 is 3, equals first group goes to 0. On the b, 2 plus 3 is 5. So if we divide both sides by 5, b is the fraction 3 fifths. Then we'll do the second factor. Let's let x equal negative 3. Plugging negative 3 in, we get negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2 equals the a, negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5. And the second group goes to 0, so a is equal to a positive 2 fifths. So we can rewrite our integral now. Instead of x plus 1 over the product, we'll write our integral as a, which is 2 fifths over the x plus 3, plus b, which we just found out was 3 fifths, over the x minus 2 dx. And that's a real quick antiderivative, pull the constant of 2 fifths out. We have the natural log of x plus 3 plus pull the 3 fifths out front. We have the natural log of x minus 2 plus a constant. And we've got our antiderivative. So if there's non-repeated linear factors where we don't have anything squared, we don't have anything cubed in the denominator, it's just x plus 3, x plus 2, really simple. We just decompose the fractions to the pieces we need. But what if one of them is repeated? What if we have a repeated linear factor? For example, we might have lowercase ax plus b squared in one of the denominators. If that's the case, we'll use a denominator for ax plus b, and we'll use a denominator for ax plus b squared. And if it was cubed, we'd count up to cube. So we're going to need one denominator for each power of the factored result. So if we want to find the integral of x minus 2 over 2x minus 1 squared times x minus 1 dx, we'll think of this as something over the 2x minus 1 
plus something else over. And because the 2x minus 1 has an exponent, we need to count up. We'll do 2x minus 1 again, but this time with the squared. And then we'll have a third one times the x minus 1. Now when we multiply by the least common denominator, when we multiply by what's missing, the original, pro the original problem, the x minus 2 has nothing missing, equals a times, it only has one of the 2x minus 1, so it needs another one, so there would be two of them, times an x minus 1, plus b. b's already got two of the 2x minus 1's. It's only missing the x minus 1 plus c times it's missing both of the 2x minus 1, so 2x minus 1 squared. Now we can pick convenient values to try and get at the values of a, b, and c. Let's start by letting x equal, looking at the first factor, the 2x minus 1, which shows up twice. Solving that, we get 1 half. When x is 1 half, those first, the first factor and the last factor, the group with a and the group with c, they all go to 0. So if x is 1 half, 1 half minus 2 is negative 3 halves equals first group goes to 0, b times 1 half minus 1, which is negative 1 half. And so if we multiply both sides by negative 2, we end up with 3 equals b. So now let's pick another value for x. Notice two of the groups have an x minus 1, which means if x equals 1, both of those will go to 0. Plugging that in, 1 minus 2 is negative 1 equals first factor goes to 0, the second factor goes to 0, the third factor, though, 2 times 1 minus 1 is 1, squared is 1. So we end up with c. c equals negative 1. Didn't have to do any work for that one. Now, that accounts for all of our factors. Those are the easy ones that we've tried. We still are missing our letter a. We don't know what a is. So to get a, we're going to pick another value for x. It's not going to be as nice, but it's not very bad either. I always pick easy, convenient things like 0, 1, and 2. 0 is a beautiful number because it's really easy to do math with. Let's start with 0. If we plug 0 in, 0 minus 2 is negative 2 equals a times, when we plug 0 into this first group, we'll end up with negative 1 times negative 1, which is positive 1, plus b times. Uh, plug 0 in, we end up with negative 1. Plus c times, plug 0 in, we end up with positive 1. But we already know what the value is for b and c. We found b and c. So let's plug those in. And we have negative 2 equals a minus b, which is 3, plus c, which is a negative 1. If we add 4 to both sides, we end up with 2 equals a. So sometimes we're going to have to do a little bit of algebra to get at the piece we need. But once we've done that, now our integral is going to be much easier to take. We've got the integral of a, which is 2 over the 2x minus 1. And let's split this up to one integral per piece, dx plus b, which is the integral of 3 over the 2x minus 1 squared dx, plus the integral of c. c we found out was negative 1 over the x minus 1. And now we're really just taking these three simple integrals. Using a little u substitution, let u equal the 2x minus 1. du is equal to 2 dx. So we've got, on this first one, the integral of 1 over u du. That's nice, because that's just going to be the natural log of u, or the natural log of 2x minus 1. 
For the second part, if we let u equal 2x minus 1, du is equal to 2 dx. So I'm going to pull the 3 out, multiply by a 2 and a 1 half inside. So we've got 3 halves on the outside times the integral of u to the negative 2 du. And when we integrate u to the negative 2, we get the u to the negative 1. But u is 2x minus 1. And we multiply by that negative 1 out front. So 3 halves times 2x minus 1 to the negative 1. And the last one, pulling the negative out front. And the derivative of the denominator is just 1. So we have the natural log of x minus 1 plus a constant. So that's kind of our second case of taking integrals of rational expressions. If we see an exponent like squared, we need the factor repeated as well with every exponent counting up. The third case that we'll look at is what's called an irreducible quadratic. Let's say we end up with an ax squared plus bx plus c. Those are lowercase, some denominator like that. What we have to do in that case is we have to account for the fact that the numerator might have an x in it as well. So we'll have a numerator of ax plus b over that irreducible quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c. Notice I've got little case, lowercase, and capital letters. Don't confuse those. Those are different values. Let's take a look at what that looks like as we find the integral of x squared plus 8 over x cubed plus 8 dx. Now, the denominator is not factored. So if we do factor the denominator, leaving the numerator as x squared plus 8 over, we have a sum of cubes. So that's x plus 2 times x squared minus 2x plus 4 dx. And so when we set up our partial frac fractions, we'll have a over the first factor of x plus 2 plus Notice the second factor is x squared minus 2x plus 4. Because there's an x squared in that denominator, we have to account that there might be an x in the numerator. And so we'll have bx plus c in that numerator. Now when we multiply by missing factors, the first part still is x squared plus 8 equals. The a is missing the x squared minus 2x plus 4 factor. Then there's the bx plus c group that's missing the x plus 2 factor. And we can solve for this much the same way. The easy one to find is we know when x is negative 2, what happens there? Negative 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 8 is 12 equals uh, negative 2 squared is 4 minus 2 times 2 is a positive 4. So 4 plus 4 plus 4 is 12a. And the second group goes to 0. And so we see pretty quick that a must equal 1. Don't want to lose that as we keep working. So I'll put stars next to it. Now, there's no f number that we can put in the second factor to make it equal to 0. But what's nice is whenever we have a bx or one of our unknowns times x, that one will go away if we make x equal to 0, another nice number. Let's look at what happens when we make x equal to 0. On the left, we have 0 squared plus 8, which is 8, 
equals the first factor if x is 0 leaves behind 4a plus b times 0 is 0. We're just left with the c times, leave a little space here. We're left with the c times when x is 0, we're left with 2. So we have 8 equals 4a plus 2c. But what's nice is we already know what a equals. a equals 1. So 8 is equal to 4 times 1, or 4 plus 2c. And if we subtract 4 and divide by 2, we'll find out that c equals 2. So if we're just careful in how we select our numbers, they'll start to fall out pretty quick. Now, when we go after our last one, there's no trick that makes everything else goes away. But if we pick an easy number, we can get at our remaining variable, get at the b. So let's pick the number 1, because that's also easy to do math with. On the left, 1 squared plus 8 is 9 equals. When x is equal to 1, we have a times 1 minus 2 plus 4 is 3 plus b times 1 is b plus c times x plus 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. So 9 is equal to 3a plus 3b plus 3c after we distribute. But we know a is 1 and c is 2. So when we plug that in, 3 times 1 is 3, plus 3b. We're still looking for b. Plus 3c, 3 times 2 is 6. If we subtract 3 and 6, we get 3b equals 0. And so b is equal to 0 in this case. which means our original integral can be rewritten as the sum of two fractions. Or let's actually break it down into two integrals. a is 1 over the x plus 2 dx plus the integral of bx, which is 0 times x, or just 0, times 2 over our x squared minus 2x plus 4 dx. Now all we have to do is just solve the resulting integrals. The first integral is easy. That's the natural log of x plus 2. The second integral is not as easy, though. And so what we're going to do is we're going to employ two tricks to force us to integrate this, because we've got a constant over a denominator. First trick we're going to do is we're going to complete the square on that denominator, where we want the first two terms to become a perfect square. Remember, to get that perfect square, we need to add half of the middle number squared. Half of 2 is 1. 1 squared is 1. So we're going to add 1. But to stay balanced, if we add 1, we have to also subtract 1. When we do that, we have the integral. Let's actually pull the 2 out front. It's not going to be useful to us. Of 1 over x squared minus 2x plus 1, which factors to x minus 1 squared, plus 3 dx. Now we can take this integral quite nicely, because we're going to recall that the integral of 1 over u squared plus a squared du is 1 over a times the tangent inverse of u over a plus a constant. But this time, u is going to be that whole x minus 1. And since that derivative is 1, that's easy to handle. We still have the natural log of x plus 2. Plus, we've got a 2 in front of the radical, or in front of the integral. 
Then our formula says we have to divide by a. a is the square root of the other number. So 3 is really the square root of 3 squared. So we'll divide by the square root of 3 times the tangent inverse of u. That's the x minus 1 over a, which is the square root of 3 plus a constant. And this becomes our antiderivative of our original problem. So if we have an irreducible quadratic, some piece that can't be factored nicely, we'll end up keeping that quadratic. Just need to make sure the numerator has that two terms in it, one term for the x and one term for the constant. So let's actually take a moment to summarize the complete process for partial fractions. What have we seen today? Well, the first thing we need to do, if we're taking some p of x over q of x, the first thing we need to do is make sure that the degree of the numerator is smaller than the denominator. So if the degree of p of x is greater than or equal to the degree of q of x, maybe the p of x has a cubic in it and q of x only has a square in it. First thing we want to do is use long division to break that out. Once we've done that, we can factor the q of x, factor that denominator. And we'll have one of three things happen in that denominator, maybe two or three of them together. If we have all linear factors, no exponents, then we'll rewrite p of x over q of x as equal to our first value over ax plus b, a1x plus b1x. And then we'll just kind of work our way across all the factors. Let's call it a2 over a2x plus b2. Plus, and we keep going one fraction all the way down to the last factor, a n x plus b n. If we have a repeated factor, let's say we see some a x plus b to the n power. It's repeated. We need to then include in a1 over just the ax plus b, plus an a2 over the ax plus b, and square it, plus and keep going all the way up until we get to our exponent, ax plus b to the n. So if there's a factor repeated, we use it multiple times in our setup. If we have a quadratic factor, something that can't factor any further, maybe that's ax squared plus bx plus c, we need to include an ax plus b over that linear factor, ax squared plus bx plus c. We've got to account for those three cases. Once we have it set up, the third step is to solve for the numerators. That's where we pick the easy values for x.
Most of the time, that'll come out really nicely with those easy values. Sometimes you'll end up with a simple si system of equations you can solve. Sometimes not so simple of a systems of equations, but definitely something we should be able to manage. And then we can finish the process by integrating the resulting expression. Usually, we'll end up with logs. Sometimes, we'll end up with inverse tangents. Sometimes, we'll end up with just fractions. But the resulting expression is always going to be easier to integrate. And so that's the process for partial fractions. The big challenge is breaking up into those linear repeated factors and quadratic factors. So take a look at the homework assignment so you can try some of these. Practice several of them. These are kind of fun. It's a game to find A, B, and C. And we'll talk about them more when we get to class.